as has been said, I work for a company called The Futures Company. Unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I did. I could predict the lottery results and, and everything else, and I'd be a much richer man as a result. I do, however, have an expertise in looking at the future and understanding where consumers are today, where markets are today, and where they're going in the future. And I'm going to share some of those perspectives with you this afternoon. Um, some of you might know some of our work. Um, we, for Board Beer, are responsible for a program called the Consumer Lifestyle Trends, which Board Beer uses uh, with uh, Irish food manufacturers to help them understand where the consumer is and where they're going. So the first thing, and this really repeats a lot of what you heard from some of the speakers this morning about the macro context, is um, priorities of change for the consumer. Just as we heard about some of those big challenges that manufacturers are facing, that the world is facing, consumers feel some of that as well. Priorities have changed somewhat. Um, you heard Tesco talk this morning about a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex. Um, consumers feel the same thing. They feel the world is increasingly hostile and uncertain. This is data from a consumer survey we do across 27,000 consumers in over 20 markets across the world. And you see here that, that consumers say the world's risky, it's uncertain, I don't know what's coming. Am I going to be in a job tomorrow? How much money am I going to have? Where's my health care going to come from? Um, how's my family going to be? All those kinds of things are uncertain now in, in the world that we face. And equally from a financial standpoint, um, consumers never feel that things are going financially well. In fact, if I had to put the, the how do things are going well for you number on the screen, it's much higher than the 62% the that's up there. But a sense that even after the crisis of 2008, actually from a personal perspective, things don't feel any better to the consumer out there. Things are still tight. And as a result, many consumers, as you see with the, the figures there on the, the right-hand side of the screen, are feeling that actually they're taking a more short-term approach to their finances. They're really still hunting around in this sort of cautious mentality. Um, it's the only way they can navigate the uncertainty that they face. And on top of that, we're feeling much more stressed. Um, I actually have another question that refers to how we're feeling about our health. Our emotional wellness, we're not happy around the world at the moment. People are not happy with their emotional wellness. We're feeling a bit more stressed. And actually, above all else, we'd like to simplify things. Really, how many people can relate to that in the audience? Would you like to simplify your lives? I certainly can in terms of my own life, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, so against that context, it would actually be quite easy to just ignore sustainability. In fact, many people were predicting before the economic crisis of 2008 that sustainability would go away in the consumer's mindset. Um, we're often asked, is sustainability a fad? Will it go away? I'm here to tell you today it's far from a fad. It's what we call a well-established trend, and it will continue to be so in the medium and the long term, for many of the reasons you heard today, but also because consumers remain engaged in the sustainability agenda. So we ask a question that says to people, have you made it a top priority to live an environmental lifestyle? Now, it's very easy to agree to this type of question in all honesty, isn't it, when you, when you get it in a questionnaire. Um, the numbers you see on screen are the, are the people who say, on a score of 1 to 10, they, they, they rank uh, having an environmental conscious lifestyle between 8 and 10. So you see here the numbers have actually gone up since 2008. And actually, that's pretty true in the majority of the countries we survey. So we, we survey across 20-plus countries. I think there are only two or three where it's actually gone down to any significant extent over that period. And what we've seen is it's gone down and tended to bounce back up. The numbers have been pretty consistent over the years. But we know that the whole population isn't necessarily engaged in sustainability to the same extent. So we developed a, a segmentation, a way of putting people into groups about how motivated they are to live a more sustainable lifestyle and, and how, how much they are actually doing that. So we have the engaged group. They're the, the, good, the good sustainable consumers. We have the constrained group who kind of feel like they want to do it, but somehow there's something that's getting in the way of them doing it on a daily basis. And then we have the unconcerned. And I have to say, there is a group of consumers out there who are unconcerned about these issues. They kind of feel, you know what, I just can't be bothered for some of those other reasons that I put up there beforehand. Some of these numbers might surprise you in terms of how many people there are in each group. We get over 60% are either engaged or constrained. I, they're motivated to live a more sustainable lifestyle. It doesn't mean they're doing it every day. It doesn't mean every time they go and buy a can of soda or every time they go and buy a beef burger 
or every time they go and buy a packet of chewing gum that they're thinking about these issues. It doesn't mean they're recycling absolutely everything in their households, but they're motivated, they're leaning towards wanting to do that kind of thing. You get about 40% who are in that unconcerned group. And actually, when you dig down, when we do qualitative work, going to talk to hundreds of consumers around the world to understand why they're unconcerned, it's because actually they don't really know what to do. They, don't, they still kind of get the issues. They still care about the planet. It's just actually they don't necessarily see the need to take account of that in their own behavior. One of the interesting things about these numbers is that they've barely changed in the last four years. In fact, if anything, we've seen a 1% to 2% increase in the engaged and constrained groups. So over 60% of consumers out there are in some way motivated to live a more sustainable lifestyle. The constrained group's interesting because they're a group that really wants to do it, but is finding other things are getting in the way. It could be cost. It could be, you know, they, they might want to recycle, for example, but there aren't recycling facilities nearby. So they're having a job to kind of convert their motivation, their positive motivation and concern about these issues into real behavior change. And that's because there are a number of limitations and barriers to us as consumers in our everyday lives living a more sustainable lifestyle. And I think this is where the opportunity exists for manufacturers, processors, to actually get across and help facilitate some behavior change with consumers in these areas. This is a kind of typical balance that we hear, and this is very much built on work we've done talking to consumers about these issues over a number of years. They kind of balance these things and go, well, I actually think living sustainably is going to be more expensive. A piece of work we did with Unilever recently in the UK outlined that 70% of consumers in the UK thought living sustainably was going to be more expensive. 70% um, of people. It's actually a cheaper way to live if you get it right, actually living sustainably. Um, it's going to take me more time and effort. I haven't got time on my plate. It's going to take me more time to work this out. The quality of the product, is it lesser quality? I'm not sure. If I'm buying a, a, a sort of a car that's sustainable, is that as good as you know, the, the other car that I might want? And how, how, I might have to sacrifice something. On the other end of the spectrum, there are some benefits. And we hear this time and time again when we see consumers who kind of made that leap. They say, actually, I'm living an environmental lifestyle. It's better for my family. The kids are happier. I'm happier. I feel more healthy. It's actually saving me money. I didn't realize, but reducing my food waste saves me money. I don't have to buy um, too much food. And it's actually fun. Um, what we found when we've gone into households around the UK, and I'll come on to this a little bit later, um, they actually find it fun once they get into these routines and the behavior stick, they find it fun and it gives them a benefit that they didn't actually anticipate going in. This is the tension that I think we all face as, as people. We have a, a role as a citizen and we want, to, we want to be a good citizen, but equally have a role as a consumer and actually we have these different heads on at different times of the day. We're, when we're in the supermarket, we definitely have the consumer head on, not always the citizen head. There's a real tension here between these two. What we find is that it is possible to resolve this tension. If you look at the kind of things that consumers buy into, they are where they don't need to make such a sacrifice. Hearing Mars and Nestle this morning talking about some of the things that they're doing with chocolate, for example. Um, you know, chocolate which tastes good and rewards, rewards cocoa farmers fairly. That's something that a consumer can buy into. I'm not sacrificing anything. I'm getting a great quality product. And I feel good, actually, when I'm buying it. One of the reasons I'm buying it is I feel good. I know I can see that it's making a tangible difference somewhere to somebody's life in the world. Equally, beauty creams that are naturally good for both skin and the planet. Not everything has to have a whole load of chemicals in there, something that many of the cosmetic and beauty companies are working on there. One of the key things here, I think, to resonate with consumers is to bring things a little bit closer to home. And there's a framework for this that we've used with consumers and manufacturers, many of the companies that we work with across the world. And I'm hoping it'll make complete sense to you the moment I put it up there. So there, there are three kinds of issues that we, we see, how we see this. And this is how consumers almost describe it. They describe our world, so the planet. Climate change, we heard a lot about that first up this morning, first couple of presentations, a lot about these big pressures that are out there in the world. What consumers are most concerned about, and I suspect if I look out here in the audience, what most of you are concerned about when you get back home tonight is your world. Your world at home, your family, your personal health, your family, the household. That's the thing that drives most consumer 
behavior. They can have all those great ideas about being motivated to live an environmentally conscious lifestyle, but it's really where the issues that most concern them are those that hit my world. Is my family safe? Is my family eating good food? The climate change stuff is nice. They kind of buy into the idea, but actually the decisions they make are more driven by the pressures at home, my world. And you see this when you look at the things that they are starting to do. The things that most consumers are starting to do around the world now in terms of sustainability, in terms of the behavior change that they're making, are things like turning off the light switch, trying to save on energy. Um, some people we, we've been speaking to are saying, actually, I'm turning the tap off a little bit now. When I, I, I used to keep the tap flowing when I was brushing my teeth, and now I'm switching it off a little bit earlier, save a bit of water. So those are little things that they can actually understand. They understand not only that they can do them, they understand to some degree the impact that those small changes in their own behavior has on the bigger issues uh, at the sort of planetary level. Now, equally, we've heard this morning, there's a big responsibility on manufacturers and on processes to make the big changes that we talked about during the early presentations this morning. But this is the way that most consumers navigate what they can do. What can I do in my own home, in my own behavior? And typically, the things that they do resonate with other areas of their life. So why is it that most consumers now are kind of thinking about saving a bit of energy, saving a bit of water? Yeah, sure, they're thinking about the planet, but actually, they're also thinking about saving money. We're, we're honestly, at the end of the day, as consumers, we're, we're often quite selfish. There's a sense of what's in it for me. Um, why are cycling schemes taking off all around the world now? Why are more consumers cycling to work? Actually, it's a more sustainable behavior, but a large part of the reason they're doing it is because they feel good about it and it makes them feel healthy. That's why a lot of consumers are doing that kind of thing. Um, another thing we, we, we hear a lot, um, particularly in cities, actually, this comes a lot when you talk to urban consumers, I like to plant fruit and vegetables with the kids. I've got a small little garden out in my home. And the reason they're doing that is to have fun with the children. It's not about saving the planet at its core level. I mean, we talked about agriculture and needing more sustainable agriculture this morning, but I, I don't think we're going to get there if we all go and plant a little plot of sort of carrots and, and broccoli and whatever it may be in, in our back gardens. That's not the way uh, forward on this. So the behaviors that stick with consumers tend to not only tick the sustainability box, but tick one of these other boxes that really reflects on their world, as well as the our world issues around the planet and that kind of thing. Here we see it. We ask people, what motivates you to live an environmentally conscious lifestyle? And we give them a long list of things that they can choose from. Um, and these three are consistent in pretty much every market around the world, and usually in the order you've got them on the screen. So 67% um, would say, actually, the reason I'm motivated to do it is I'm concerned about my own health and my family's health. There's a massive connection. It's very important for the food industry to understand between sustainable, sustainability and health. In fact, many of the organizations that I deal with have health as a core sustainability goal. We've heard that from some of our speakers this morning. The second one is I want to preserve it for my future generations. Or actually, as we were talking about over dinner with my fellow speakers last night, I want to look good in front of the kids. That's the way, actually, it comes across in consumer language if you actually go into the household. You get a lot of kids now who are being taught about sustainability at school, and they're bringing those behaviors into the household and going, hey, mom, dad, what are we doing? That's really what that 62% is about. It's actually wanting to do something that makes your kids look up to you and feel good about themselves. And then at 52%, the third most important up there we have, I have a, a sense as a global citizen. So that's the bigger kind of, I want to be responsible to the world. I do feel it's my responsibility. But again, primarily it's about a personal health goal, a family goal, then about looking for it in front of my kids. And only then does this kind of overall sense of responsibility come through. Um, the other thing that I think is important to understand here is, at the end of the day, when we talk about sustainability, the very word itself doesn't mean a lot to most consumers. Um, so if you talk about sustainable food and you ask a consumer to go and tell you what they understand by that, equally, if you look at some of the certification schemes that we heard about this morning, things like the Rainforest Alliance, people have a sense that that's a good thing to do. But actually, when we did research for the Rainforest Alliance people about what their little frog logo meant, nobody could tell you. Nobody really knew 
what that logo was about and what it was doing. What you really need to do is make it tangible. And this image is there for a reason. It's a very personal image, this one, because I, my parents live in the Vale of Evesham, which is a small area, market garden area, in the Cotswolds of the UK. And it's an area, um, Dan and, and Rona and others from PepsiCo in the audience will know this, where the, the tomatoes that go into the prawn cocktail flavour of Walker's Crisp in the UK come from the Vale of Evesham. The reason I tell this story is because whenever I pick up the phone to my mother, who still lives there, she tells me this. She reminds me about this every single time we talk. She goes, I just saw that advert again. And the reason she remembers it is because actually the farmer in the advert and who's in some of the marketing that PepsiCo are doing around this is a friend of hers. But it's actually started to resonate with me as well. So I've actually switched my flavor affinity within the PepsiCo Walker's Empire from salt and vinegar to the Vale of Eastern Tomato Prawn Cocktail. I actually didn't like Prawn Cocktail, Chris, before you guys did this, so you've won me over. If there's a peak in the UK consumption of prawn cocktail crisps, I may well be the person who's responsible for it over the last three weeks. Now, the reason I tell that story is because this has a more of an emotional connection with the consumer than any of those certification schemes. And what I think was beautifully articulated by what JC from McDonald's showed us this morning is the way that you can take a certification scheme like the one that Born Beer has launched here and really get it across to the consumer in terms of what's the story behind it, what's the tangible, real difference that this is making. What am I doing when I buy into this proposition? And it's a great story, I think, that we have. And we saw this morning with how McDonald's has used that in its own marketing, tying in with what Bob Beer is trying to do. The emotional resonance of these things is very, very important. Consumers today have so much choice in terms of the food that they choose to eat, the restaurant that they go to, the brand that they buy in the supermarket. And actually, I think some of what McDonald's is doing, if I use that as an example, is actually giving people a reason to feel better about going to a McDonald's restaurant. That, as I understand it, is the core benefit of what they're doing. And the reason they're able to do that is because the certification scheme there, and there's a great story, a great human story, that most of us as individuals in our daily lives can connect with. We understand that story of that farmer and what he's doing and how that translates into McDonald's product. So what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say here is the language around sustainability is changing. Consumers are still engaged, but the emphasis around the issues is changing somewhat. Um, somebody asked me this morning if we get a lot of clients coming to us to ask about sustainability. And I, and I guess the shift that I would see over the last 10 years um, and is that we used to have to preach about sustainability to our clients. They didn't want to know, to be honest. Now they want to know more and more and more and more. We're asked for a new perspective every single day. Um, so the, there's a change there, and I think that's reflected in actually the way that consumers are kind of engaging in this in the marketplace. Here's the reason why. Their scrutiny and their expectations around sustainability are changing. Um, you saw earlier on, I showed a statistic that said 60% of people across the world are motivated to live an environmentally conscious lifestyle. Now, I suspect if I, if I roll the years back to about 2002, 2003, it would just be what we used to call the low has segment, the sort of slightly green fringe edge of the consumer base that was buying into that proposition. Now it's mainstream. But equally, consumers, because of that stress, because of that desire for simplification that I talked about earlier, they want you guys, by which I mean the food industry, to take care of this. They'll buy into your proposition if you can give them a reason why. But they want it to be an easy choice, because they haven't got all the time in the world to do this. So they want you to put your house in order and give them an easy choice. So you see here, 84% of consumers around the world saying, I expect the companies whose products I buy, to take steps to avoid damaging the environment. I'm expecting you guys to do it. And I think the program uh, that Bob Beer's got in place is a very good example of actually trying to take care of this, trying to educate the industry. If you stay behind this trend, you're going to be out of business in a few years' time. This is absolutely crucial. Um, equally, they've actually smartened up to some of the marketing efforts that some of the companies we've had in the room today are kind of... They know that when you're doing this, you're actually trying to sell something to them. But that's OK, as long as you're doing the right thing. So they know that when you're marketing to them in this way, you're trying to sell them a product. But that's OK. They're, they're not idiots. They know you're trying to market your brand across. 
as long as you're taking care of things in-house, as long as you've got sustainable sourcing, sustainable processes, transparency is a key word. We've heard that a number of times this morning already. That's the key. So I guess the message is don't preach about sustainability to the consumer base. They don't like to see messages like this. Recycling. You should recycle. It's a duty. It's not a choice. Not quite the right message. If you give that message to a consumer, they're probably likely to either ignore it or give you a blast back in your face and say, hey, guys, what are you doing about this? Don't celebrate too much too quickly. There's, this is actually a story of a, of a great little brand in New Zealand that tried to sort of change the way that we think about bottled water. Um, they had a great, great idea. They changed the kind of composition of the bottle. They went out and said, you know, we're honest water. The thing that they didn't account for is New Zealand, which is where they're based. The recycling facilities to actually deal with the bottles coming out at the other end weren't in place. So the consumer, in theory, had a sustainable product, but then they had to send it to another country to get it recycled. So there's a lot of chatter in the social media sites you see in the bottom corner of the slide there about why this product actually wasn't recyclable and wasn't, wasn't responsible. And eventually the brand came around and kind of actually then worked with the authorities to put recycling facilities in place. The problem was they went to market first, so the brand was overall damaged. You can't celebrate your own successes too much. And I think that's also um, a great story in terms of how broad beer and most of the organizations we talked to this morning think about this. It's a journey. There is not one organization anywhere in the world that is getting this 100% right. We're all going through a journey and we're all trying to improve our practices. And the, cons the consumers know that. They know that big business isn't 100% perfect. They're not expecting you to be. So just be honest with them. This is the key. Make sustainability tangible, real, and rewarding for the consumer. I talked about it having to fit with life's priorities earlier on. Um, a couple of examples here from, from very different sectors about how different companies have tried to sort of make sustainability fit. And a story here about a, a Colombian white goods manufacturer. I think it's may, Mabe rather than Maybe. Um, so they're, they're about sort of a water-saving uh, washing machine. Many of them are on the market. What they've done um, in rural towns in Colombia and, and the cities as well, it's kind of got this exchange scheme going whereby people can donate clean water to rural towns in Colombia where they're not there. And the feeling the consumer gets is great because I, I might want to donate some water to you. And actually, you, I, I know that you can see I'm donating the water to you. So I automatically feel I'm getting a, a feel-good factor out of that. I know that I'm giving you something. There's a real tangible um, thing that I'm handing over and a real tangible emotional reward that I'm getting through that action. Um, another thing... Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen here, Volkswagen taps into the gamification of sustainability. They, they have this mobile app that shows you how much you save through your driving habits. Um, they also show you whether you're the most eco-driver in China or not. And this has turned, I, I gather, into a bit of a game between uh, particularly uh, the young guys in China who like gaming anyway. They're all competing to win the competition um, to see who's the most sustainable driver. But they can also get tips here in terms of how they can become more sustainable still. So they've turned this into a game. And there's, there's a number of other organizations who've tapped into this idea of, of both emotional rewards, but also financial rewards for sustainability. So I think that's the key. Don't, don't preach. Make it real. Make it tangible and rewarding. And rewarding is as much about the emotional benefit as it is about the financial benefit. And, and finally, I think this is where the future's headed. Um, I love the thoughts we had this morning on shared value from a number of, of the business people who came up and spoke. And I think Unilever is an organization we do an awful lot of work with in this space. Um, they're up amongst those organizations that are credited alongside many of those that we heard this morning as being one of the best in terms of sustainability. Their global CEO, Paul Polman, is given a lot of credit for the work he's done at Unilever making them more sustainable. And we've just conducted a six-month experiment. Uh, it was described in the press as a social experiment with about a dozen households in the UK. We followed these guys for six months. Each month, they got a new task, uh, a sustainability challenge, if you will. So the first month, it was reduce your food waste by 25%. The second month, it was reduce the amount of water you use in the household by 20%. These kind of things. 
And we give them all the tips and guidance and advice that is out there. And we try to understand which of those things was useful and which of those things was actually a real pain for them. What was interesting from this was it really gave Unilever as an organization a sense of how tough behavior change is with consumers. But also the ability to actually do play a role as a business within facilitating behavior change in the household. Some of the work we did really got them to understanding what really went on in the household. So they might do a lot of marketing around sustainability, but how much of it was really having traction with the consumer? What was really going on? Were people really stopping showering for so long? How were they doing that? Um, and I think the other thing that Unilever has recognized as a business, and this is why I think, say I, I think they're one of the vanguard, is they've recognized that their responsibility doesn't stop when the consumer buys the product. They're now looking at what they can do beyond the point of purchase. So things, things like food waste, that all happens once you've bought, well, not all, but a, a significant proportion of it happens once you've bought the product. So they're not saying our responsibility stops the moment the consumer buys the product. They're, they're working, for example, their PG Tips brand is working on a pilot with local authorities to allow people to understand they can recycle their tea bags. And they're working with local authorities to put things in place that make it easier for consumers to do that. Um, they don't need to do that. They just decided, as a sustainable corporation that believes in this kind of thing, that's what they're going to do. They're trying to take the effort out of it for the consumer. They're trying to show them the small steps that consumers can make um, without preaching to them. And that's the crucial thing here. I'm going to leave it there, but I guess my message would be don't preach. Certainly, Board B has got a lot of things in the right place moving this forward. Um, I think it's a key issue, and I guess I would leave you with a message that somebody asked me every dinner last night. Is this a fad or is it a trend? It's not only a trend. It's going to be here for as long as we all live. Thank you for listening. <laughs>